During this Easter tide, if you followed the mass of uh, the daily mass, throughout the next 50 days, we basically will read the entire Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles is basically the first history book of the church. It's the account of what happened after the resurrection and how the church formed around those who had known Jesus and experienced the resurrected Christ in one way or another. And that's really what unites the church, what forms the church. It's the experience of the resurrection. And thus the Acts of the Apostles are exactly that. What did these 12 men who knew Christ, those who were around them and that knew either Christ or knew those who knew Christ personally, what did they do in that time of the resurrection? How did they act? Well, if we read the Acts of the Apostles, it'll tell us exactly what they did, how they acted, what they said, and what they did. And that is the account of the first church. And though many send, well, thousands of years have passed since then, still there are many things that we hold in common, other things that have changed perhaps. But what still binds us together, what still forms the church, is that understanding of Christ's life in light of the resurrection, is that understanding and that promise of the resurrection. The reading that we just heard also, along with Acts of the Apostles, throughout this time, we're going to be reading the entire Gospel of John as well, or at least the parts that are relevant to the life of Christ and the resurrection of the Lord. We already started with it on Good Friday because that's what you hear, the passion of Good Friday is the passion according to St. John. And so throughout the year, actually, and every other year, they take turns listening to Matthew, Luke, or Mark, the Synoptic Gospels. And they're more or less, for the most part, pretty much the same thing with, my, with some variances. However, John's is the one that sticks out. It's the most different of all of them. And then perhaps they save it for, the Easter, for Easter time for a special reason. It's funny because what you just heard right now in this Gospel technically are not words from Jesus. In every other gospel reading that we normally hear, it's Jesus saying something, doing something. However, here, we don't hear Jesus say anything. This is a reflection, a reflection of the gospel of the evangelist, a reflection of one who heard Jesus' words and now makes sense out of them after the fact of the resurrection. That's why John's gospel sets aside, is set aside, because John's got, and the symbol for John is the eagle, he has the eagle eye. He sees now, he understands, and he interprets everything that happened. The other three are more reports, so you know what happened. John's a little more partial. He's actually interpreting it for you. He's an early theologian, and we have right here a theological, one of the first theological reflections we can say that the church has had. This reflection on what it meant, the sacrifice of Christ, and what the resurrection means at the end. This is taken in the context of the speech that Christ had with Nicodemus, which on Monday and Tuesday was the gospel of, uh, uh, in the daily mass. Nicodemus, who's a teacher uh, or a rabbi of Jerusalem, and he starts, Christ starts explaining to him some of the mysteries of the faith. And so here is the reflection of John after he's heard this, now makes sense out of it. It's rather eschatological. It's telling us about end times in a certain way. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He's almost speaking into the future, and that's exactly what he's doing in here. And with that eschatological image, that word that we heard a lot of times, eschatology, the end of times, there are a couple of images that always get drawn up. We are reminded that Christ is a divine judge, and he's placed again as a judge in here. We've heard that, that illusion or that allegory of Christ's judge. And any judge... Well, what exactly does he do? What is he judging? The judge at the end can either acquit or condemn. It's his job. He weighs the evidence before, he weighs the argument, and at the end acquits or condemns. We are reminded that Christ is a judge, and he either acquits or condemns. However, what we find out about this judge is that he's not a judge as maybe the ones that we know, and especially not like the Roman judges who were partial, who could definitely be swayed, and they were. That was actually legal back then. 
Christ is not the partial judge that's seeking condemnation, that delights in dropping the hammer of justice. But rather, Christ is the judge who is eagerly awaiting the penitent, who eagerly re receives the humble and wants to acquit the penitent sinful man. He's eager to show us that mercy. He's eager to receive the one who confesses his name. And so this is the way that Christ is normally figured as a judge. In fact, if you look at some of the older churches, and I might have mentioned it at other times, especially if you go to the older churches in Rome and, and, uh, and, and, and throughout Europe, usually in the apse at the end, at the back of the basilica, and remember a basilica basically was an ancient Roman courthouse, is what it was, the judge's bench was right in the apse, it's right in the back. It's the highlighted part that you see when you enter a basilica, is that, that niche in the back. And that's where the judge or the emperor would sit and render his judgment. It's not for nothing that we place Christ in there, in our church basilicas. In the niche that's in the back, that's the place where Christ resides. You find a tabernacle there, and you'll find the image of Christ. In the ancient church, it was always Christ as judge, seated on the bench, throne, holding the scroll of the law on one hand and the finger raised of judgment on the other. Go to the National Basilica, in, uh, in Washington, D.C., and you'll see the same thing right above you. Christ is figured as this divine judge, and it's interesting what happens, how we play ourselves into this. Because if he's in the apse over that altar, and that's where we go to receive the sacrament, and where we process, and where I as a priest process and present my prayers, in a certain way I'm marching, and every time you approach the altar, you're doing this, the same thing. You're marching, you're making your own procession towards your own judgment. It's almost as if we're in a reenactment or a practice, uh, a dress rehearsal of our own judgment. We present ourselves before the divine judge who will be enthroned on top of that altar. However, we don't approach him with the fear of condemnation as we might another judge but with hope and faith of mercy. And that's why in the Church of the Jesu in Rome, perhaps they get this the best, because they do have that apocalyptic scene in the back. Christ as the Lamb of God that's enthroned as a judge, but there's a happy banquet around it. There are the choirs of angels singing, and they have them there with their instruments and singing, and everyone is joyous as they present themselves for that judgment. And this is perhaps what separates us and our way of looking at that judgment. The Christian, the faithful Christian, who has confessed the name of the Lord, who has, who has been a testimony of that resurrection, when he presents himself on that day before that judge, he can look up at the judge, not holding his head down in shame, but his head up and his eyes cast up in hope and expectation, for he knows who he is. He knows that judge and what he wants of us. And so too, when we present ourselves to this altar, we say that amen before being presented Christ, the judge before us. We do a reenact, we do basically that dress rehearsal every time we approach that altar for that last day. Let us be practiced. So when our day does come, and we're all gonna have to face the judge one day, that day is also a joyous day. It's a banquet like the one we're going to have right now afterwards. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.